Hey there, everyone. Welcome back. Today, I'm going to share on God's redemption plan and how Jesus, being Emmanuel, explains so much of what God's plan is. I'll start with um, ancient wells and what he has given, the things that he has put in place and his, his moves that are meant to supply us with life and understanding. So don't go anywhere. I know you don't want to miss any of this exciting discussion. Be the ones to see it through and everything lost will be renewed. Long ago in the garden it was to be. Now a dream fulfilled in you and me. Whoa, oh, oh. We must find the old wells and dig them out. The work of God has often been covered it's been covered with with so many things and the, and lost to us. The the things that God really has done and what He's taught, they have, they've they're not been just obvious. We we often think we, they are, and so we just read the scripture and we think, oh, that's got that's everything that we need to know. But ideas and thoughts and mindsets change and shift, and we've had to recover many things that were lost to apostasy, to to turning away from God. And so just like different kings had to go back and discover the scrolls and read about uh, God's law in order for Israel to follow uh, the, the leadership of Yahweh again, we have to do, go find these wells. And otherwise, we won't properly understand the context of what God has given us in the scriptures so much. So we have to go deep and, and, and let God speak to us. In Genesis um, 26, 18 it says, then Isaac dug again the wells of water, which had been dug in the days of his father, Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the same names, which his father had given them. I like that because he, he, he recognized uh, you know, that the names of the times, you know, when, when Abraham dug them out, he gave names because they, it was for the power of God was giving them the land and giving them vision. And, and Isaac was capturing that. And what we get from this vision of going back to the wells is very, very important. It, it helps us. It is, it is a mindset that we have to have that after people die, after things pass away, oftentimes those things get lost to us. God pours out his, his redemption plan for us in history throughout the scriptures incrementally. He didn't do it all at one time. There's many reasons, but one of the reasons why we couldn't understand. We needed to understand um, what sin actually is. Um, I think when Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't have a comprehension of what it really was. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. They were deceived, and so they didn't understand it, but they didn't understand the consequence either. God couldn't send Jesus. He couldn't bring salvation for what we needed until we actually understand it, until the, the working of that actually comes into uh, existence so that we can actually put it into play because it's not just about forgiveness of sins. I'm going to get into all that as I, as I go through here. It's, it's so important that we see God's plan as much bigger, much bigger. And so in order for us to receive redemption, we have to actually gain this understanding. Adam and Eve, they, I believe, it's, I think scripture bears this out, that they thought their son was Jesus, not literally Jesus, but they thought he was the Messiah. He, they thought he was the promise that God had given because God had given Eve a promise in Genesis 3.15. Um, God gave her a promise and she, he, said, he said that your son, uh, you know, it says, it says he will um, be, be the one that deli brings deliverance. You're not going li to live like this forever. You, they were cast out of the garden. You're not going to live like this forever. There's salvation coming. It's coming through you, Eve. It's coming through you. He said, he will stomp on the devil. He will stomp on the serpent, but, and, the, and the serpent will bruise his heel. That was in the promise to Eve. So when Cain was born, her immediate response is, I have received a man from Yahweh. I believe that when... You know, they didn't, it's not, I don't believe it's clear what they understood, what they didn't understand. But I do think that, that we have presumed that they didn't understand because at the time of Jesus, nobody understood or very little was understood about the way the Messiah was actually going to be and what salvation was going to really look like. God couldn't just bring deliverance. Otherwise he would have, because God 
has no desire for destruction and wickedness to prevail. He says he hates it. She's she and Ab- and not Abraham getting ready to go into Abraham. She and Adam, I believed they were looking forward to this. They didn't have a perspective of history, what was going to transpire. They wanted to see God bring that deliverance. I believe they were looking for it in their life, just like we all look for it. We look f- to see the fullness, the completion of God's purposes in our life and in what we see in the scriptures. We look to see it happen. That's the right thing to do. But we need more perspective to actually see our place and, and understand. Adam and Eve thought it was going to happen. I believe that they, they thought, oh, we're, when she got pregnant, they didn't understand pregnancy. Um, you know, they were, they were, um, Adam was made out of the dust and Eve was formed from, from a rib. They didn't know what having babies was like. She gets pregnant. Her belly is growing and this baby starts moving and she's like, it's here. We get to go home. We get to go back to the garden. That's, I believe that's the, the essence of where they were, what they felt. So the people, the, the men of God, who, who we talk about in the scriptures, who had the vision for the kingdom of God, they had an understanding that we think they didn't have. We think of them more as Neanderthals, as cavemen, you know, that didn't have understanding. That, that sometimes is in our mindset about, about th- people in the past, that they didn't have understanding. But they actually had more than what we have in a lot of cases because it's been lost to us. But they also didn't have things that we do because the, the incremental outpouring that the Spirit of God does in the creation and throughout history, revealing his plan. So you go forward a little bit to, to Abraham. Abraham understood the Messiah. He, he was um he had he had carried this. You know, I've counted this, it's only like three different people that that had to have um communicated with each other for Abraham to have received the gospel because of how long these men lived in succession. And so you have um, many men that could have talked to Adam and then to Noah and then to Abraham. There's not very many, maybe it's more than three. I can't remember right now, but it's, it's not very many word of mouth. So Abraham had this vision of the Messiah. And so God is pouring out his vision about more. He says, I'm looking for a man who will teach his children my ways. It's bigger. We're understanding that establishing God's ways is what Adam and Eve were supposed to do, but they lost that. And so God is looking to rebuild, to pour out himself upon mankind. And I believe this is revealed in Abraham's response to when God spoke to him and told him to sacrifice Isaac. I have studied this and I've looked at this and a lot of people use this as as a means to attack our faith because of this story. And I think that a lot of times they illegitimately use the scripture against um, us and against the the purposes of God. But there is legitimacy that we don't answer. We, we Again, unstopping these wells. Abraham understood the Messiah principle. He knew that there was going to be a child born that would end the curse. Just like Adam and Eve thought they were going to go home to the garden. And then as reality settled in, that they were going to only exist through the sweat of their brow and the labor um, of trying to till the land and it wouldn't yield its increase. They, that settled in. The vision began to grow and it began to pass down. And Abraham has this vision. He understands this. So when God comes to him, yeah, just like just like God sacrificing his son, this is not easy. This is not, this is never easy because it's true sacrifice. But Abraham, and we know that Abraham had a vision. He knew that God could raise him from the dead, which is what happened to Jesus. So there's faith involved. It doesn't take away the the seriousness, the heaviness of having to actually be the one that, that sacrifices your son. But Abraham could do it in faith because not only did he know that he could be raised from the dead, but he also believed and understood and looked. I, it seems apparent that he knew or thought he knew that this is the time. Now is the time the Messiah has come. Isaac was a son of promise. God had promised him. He said, in your seed will all the nations of the world be blessed. So Isaac is this. He was born of a miracle. Both his mother and his father couldn't have children anymore. And God supernaturally revived them and gives them their son. These types of understanding are the wells if we if we lose that for one thing that turns into a human sacrifice scripture that is is 
gives us a perspective on God. I mean, I know we turn, we we say, well, he was testing him. He 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 provided the lamb all along. Yes, he did, and those are good answers for to prove that the mindset to attack God is wrong. But we miss the depth of what God has has done there. This well, these 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 areas of the things that God has done as He's poured out moves, and so Abraham was establishing this family. And so you have the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three generations of the people of God that God is is showing us. I'm establishing this. But he goes further. God wanted to, to build a nation. He wanted to have a nation of people because, again, bringing the perspective. And so I want to go to another, another man. We have a Savior is born when the family the, that has not been fully a nation yet, but there's lots of people. The family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are slaves. An edict goes out to kill all the, all the sons of Israel. And a mother has a vision, and she gives up her son, puts him on the water. And he ends up in the court of the king of Egypt. This, this man is born and he's spared from the murderous acts of the king to be raised in the king's house as a prince of Egypt. But God pulls him aside. God shows him. He pours out a move in his heart, but says, says, come aside and see. Come aside and see this power of God burning but not consuming the bush. And he talks to him and he sends him to deliver his people. And pull him out of Egypt and establish a nation. Not only does he now have a man, a man who responds, because because he's looking for hearts, he's searching for hearts, and he wants us individual. But then he has a family. Now he has a nation that he delivers in might and power and brings them. <laughs> and he designed it originally. Again, because not everything happens perfectly, but it's enough for us to get the vision because God can then move forward. Once we have his example and we understand his purposes on the earth enough, he can move to the next phase. And he designed it for all of us, each man to be a priest unto him. Each one of us to intercede to bring reconciliation between God and man and bring sinners back to him. This is what the priesthood shows us. But we know wickedness came in. They, they worshiped the golden calf and only the tribe of Levi stood with the Lord, only one tribe. But that gives us still enough of, of what the ministry of what being a priest is supposed to be about and the purposes of God, and how redemption. So we, we get the picture of the sacrificial order, and we see the animals being slaughtered. But, but you know, God did that originally. He slew an animal. God did that. He, did, he wasn't trying to push Adam and Eve away. He wanted to redeem them, but he couldn't fully redeem them until we understood what was lost and what it really takes to overcome sin, to actually restore our hearts back to him and, and heal the damage, heal the brokenness of what sin and rebellion actually causes. It's not just about forgiveness. I'll get into that in a little bit. Fast forward. John the Baptist shows up before the Messiah. He shows up and he's, he's preaching, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sin in Mark one, four, John is teaching something that is a little bit different in the, in the law, in the old covenant, um, they sacrificed animals, right? And when Adam and Eve sinned, God slew an animal and clothed them, right? So we see the sacrifices of animals, um, used here in conjunction with, with sin and the covering of sin. But here, John does, he preaches something different. He says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. I don't know. People can, you can make an argument that, well, this is not a distinctly different thing, but I believe it's, I believe it's very clear that John is teaching this and this is, he's not telling them to go make sacrifices for their sins. He's teaching them to repent. This is a new thing. This has not been done before. And 
I believe it is important. Like I said, you can debate these things. Um, we're good in Christianity at debating. I want to get, have a vision of the purposes of God. I don't want to sit there and get lost in something or stuck in something. But because what I see happening here is that it's preparing the way for the Messiah. It's preparing the way for, for the way God moves in us and on us, on his people. So he's not teaching about sacrifice. He's teaching us something different about forgiveness. Forgiveness is something that is the heart of God. God wants to forgive. He is a forgiver. He's not holding things against people. He just knows what really happened, what the real damage is, and is trying to do the real work of, of cleansing us. So he's teaching this, and Jesus hasn't been sacrificed yet either. So the, the sacrifice is not what he's talking about. He's talking about repentance. He's talking about changing our minds, changing our understanding, and being forgiven of our sins. Just to touch on that a little bit more, in Hebrews chapter 9, it says, in the law, there is no repentance of sin without the shedding of blood. That's the same word forgiveness that, that used in Mark. It's in Hebrews, but it's used in a different context here. It says there, there's no forgiveness of sin or repentance of sin because he's talking about the removal or the lifting um, the, for God to forgive us. I'll get into that in just a little bit. He's in, in Hebrews, he's not talking about the same thing. He's not talking about individual personal forgiveness or our ability to forgive so when someone has done something wrong to us. He's talking about the need for the people. Moses killed the animals and he sprinkled the blood upon the congregation to cleanse them, to make the covenant that God was trying to do to establish that nation under him. And so there, that was impossible. Those sins couldn't be removed. The, the, the people that, that God was trying to establish, they, they were just like the pagans. They were just like the other nations without this being set apart by the sacrifice, by the shedding of this blood. And like I said, this is to show God's bigger plan. He's making a covenant with a nation. It's not just an individual. And, and yes, there's, there, there's commands to make sacrifices for individuals. So I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that forgiveness, God is trying to cleanse us. And there's a bigger purpose in what he's teaching us with the sacrifices and with those things. It's bigger than just forgiveness. And I know this because when John saw Jesus, when he was baptizing, he looks up and he says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He takes away. He used a different term there. That word takes away means to lift, to remove the oppression that, that is pushing down, that is holding us and then keeping us stuck. That is what the work of the law could not do because we were always um, continually could still have the mindset that, and so we're given a picture of it. And we are given the access to operate and live in the blessing and the, the comforts of, of God ruling a nation. But now God is lifting it further. He's showing us of what the Lamb of God, what the sacrifice is about. God doesn't have trouble. He really doesn't. It's not hard for him to forgive it's his very nature. And I think this is, we have done such an injustice to God because we've turned the sacrifice that Jesus made and we've turned things into this, that God is full of anger and, and, and he's mad at us. Please have that washed away. We just went like your sins are washed away. Have that washed away. God is good. He's kind. It is the destruction, the destruction caused by sin and the evil that transpires that requires much more forgiveness could he could have forgiven an adam and eve don't get I, I believe that with all my heart he could have forgiven adam and eve their sins actually were forgiven do you believe adam and eve went to hell that they were condemned no i absolutely believe that they were people of god they were awesome people of god in fact they didn't go on living in sin. They were, they were passionate about this, this redemption. They lived it, loving God. God is not angry at people. He's not angry at people. We've got to get that into our heads. He only destroys people who must be stopped because they're perpetrating evil upon others in a level that can't just simply be contained. They have to be stopped. And so God raises up people. He raises up nations. He raises up many different things to stop evil. 
because it's destroying and perverting many other people. So that's what he does. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 5, is it easier to say be healed or to say your sins are forgiven? This is another verse that's so powerful. But again, we have to unstop these, these wells. We have, to get, we have to find what God is really meaning in, these, in many different places and grab a hold of his heart instead of our theology or our philosophy or our religion that we've established upon our limited understanding and get his bigger perspective. Jesus said, I say that you, to this man that your sins are forgiven so that you, talking to us, talking to the people that are listening, talking to us who are reading, so that you will know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins. On earth. Why is that so key? We know that that Jesus forgave sins, we, looking back. Why is this such a big deal? Because we've misunderstood Jesus' words. I believe this with all my heart, and I know, again... These things can be debated, but to me, it bears out. It, it shows with the, with the heart of God. So I, I'm going with the heart of God, and this is why I come to my beliefs and why I believe these things. And so <clears throat> open our eyes, Lord, to the reality. I believe that he's saying he's not talking about himself. They translated it son of man there because translators have a tendency to look at things and think of them from a theological standpoint instead of what the words often actually mean. And that can be very good because many things we need more of that understanding that the, the simple words in the language don't contain it because it's talking about a topic that is about what God has revealed and the things that he's doing. But in this case, the word son of man, I believe he's just talking about a person. He's saying so that you will know that you as a human being born of Adam's race, a son of man, I believe that's what his point is. He's not talking about himself. He calls himself the son of man. But in this case, I believe he is talking about us. He's saying that you have the power to forgive sins on earth. It is important that you know this because if you don't, you end up with all these different things. And Jesus' teaching bears this out. You have heard eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That's the law because equality under the law. If you did something wrong, you have to repay it. But he's teaching us, you actually can forgive. You don't have to require recompense for what was done wrong to you. Obviously, there are bigger things that, that we can't necessarily equal out like that. But if somebody steals from me, I can forgive them and not require them to give up what they have to repay me. I can do that. And so forgiveness of sins is the heart of God, and it's supposed to be in our heart, made in the image of God with the power to forgive what people do wrong to us. God has this same heart. He doesn't hold it against us. This is crucial to understanding him. Like I said, I know we have different ideas. You might have studied that and, and really disagree with that in the past, but please don't, don't, don't reject it just because of a preconceived idea and don't necessarily receive it just because I'm saying it, but just take it before the Lord. Because I really do think that there, this is, this is so powerful to understand that God's forgiveness of sins is not why Jesus came. If that was what he came for, he would have been born the first son to born to Adam and Eve. He would have been um, given much earlier because God hates destruction. He hates sin. He hates what's going on. So please, Open our, God, open our hearts. We need to receive this. We need this washing, this cleansing of the way sin has destroyed us, the way we, we look at everything and we see everything from that perspective. God, heal us. Live with us. One of Jesus' titles is Emmanuel, and it means God with us. We've heard, Most of us have heard that many different times. Often, this is ascribed to him. You know, this, that when we say God with us, that's ascribed to Jesus being on the earth. But I don't think that that is, is the fullness or, or, or even really the, full, the reality of what is being conveyed there. Because I don't think the people at that time conceived of it that way. I think they knew it because they used that term in different times throughout the Old Testament. And um, when God moves, that was considered Emmanuel. When they would see the power of God do something, they're like, God's with us. God is with us. So... 
When Jesus is there, he is Emmanuel. He's the perfect, complete, absolute representation of the meaning of this to its fullness. And so you see him touching people, the power of God moving and healing. So we ascribe to Jesus, he is our Emmanuel. But it's more than that. It's, he's the example of what Emmanuel actually looks like. Because Emmanuel is not something that was a one-time thing. Jesus came, he died, he raised again, and then he left. He said, it's necessary that I go. Why is it necessary to go? I want to have God with me. I want to have God with me. No, God didn't. Jesus being here doesn't get, or being gone doesn't do away with that. <laughs> He said, I see what the father, I see the only do what I see the father doing. Jesus walked in such a close, such a complete relationship with his father. And he showed us by doing this, he showed us how he intended our lives to be. We are supposed to live in intimacy. We're supposed to have God with us in every area of our life. God, God walked with Adam in the garden. He longed for relationship. When Adam sinned, he was hiding, and God was like, where are you, Adam? Where are you? God came for him. Do you think God didn't know what happened? Yes, he knew, but he's still longing for him, still looking for him, trying to draw him out, draw him out. Come, Adam, come. At the cross when Jesus died, the veil was torn. We've heard this. We know these things, but putting it in in more context of what, what the fullness of what this is, it exposed the holy place. When it tore, it exposed this holy place that wasn't supposed to be seen because it could, we could die if we went into, into the presence of the Lord. But God wanted us cleansed. Again, remember the sprinkling? The sprinkling of the blood that, that removes sins? Well, we're now sprinkled by the blood because Jesus died. So we have the right to enter in. The removal of these sins on the congregation, the destruction, the lifting up that come... It comes through Jesus. He takes away the sins of the world. God's heart was restored. <laughs> not, not his heart himself, but was restored to us. We could actually relate and see and have relationship. This is his heart, what he longs for. Emmanuel is intended to be with what each of us live. It's not a man Yes, Jesus was Emmanuel, but it's not a man. It is what mankind, what we are intended to live, God with us. This is what taking away the sins is about. God wants to take away our sins. God knew that for our sins to be remitted, there had to be a sacrifice. A sacrifice has to be given, right? Jesus said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. Yes, God called him. <laughs> he said, I give you my son. This is my son. But Jesus had to face the real consequences of sin, the real destruction. See how evil it is. He could have gotten angry. He could have, could have completely. But what did he do on the cross? We see the perfect representation of how God's heart manifests. He says, forgive them for they don't know what they do. That's what he saw because we don't. And that doesn't give us excuse. We're evil. We do many wicked things as people. But God sees past that. He knows that we really don't understand. So he has to reveal it, show his better way. We must have, we must have the idea that God is angry and mean and his wrath is aimed at us. And it required Jesus to be killed, to remove every every bit of, of God's anger and wrath, we have to have that washed away. We have to have that washed away. That is not God. That is wrong. His wrath is towards evil. It's towards the wickedness. It's towards the destruction. It's towards all of that, that he wants to remove. He wants to lift us up from that oppression that is pushing down. That's on us. This is what he wants. We have to have that wash from our Christian existence. God does not want that in us. We, have, we, we sing songs and we talk about, about the wrath of God being satisfied. And sometimes I understand that we're writing it from the perspective of knowing that sin is upon us. But we still have this concept written into our theology that God is mean and he's not. He's not angry at us. He loves us. It was actually his anger with sin 
is because he loves us so much. It was his love for us is why he gave his only son to die. Jesus walked with that same true love in communion with his father. He lived out Emmanuel, living it out. He laid his life down for us. This is salvation. This is the gospel. It's so beautiful, but we've turned it into, we've lost it. We've lost the the connection with the reality of that is the bigger purpose, that it is not just forgiveness. Forgiveness can and is granted. You can grant forgiveness. You can be a an administer of, of God's love and forgive and be, be a giving and loving person. But our human tendency is to take each time God pours out a movement on the earth, every single time he does this, <clears throat> our tendency is to presume that it is everything. Oh, he's done. He's done with it. We run with it. And often we actually forget in the process of, of receiving something that God just did. We forget all that he has done that leads us to that point. <laughs> That's important. We can't do that. None of it makes any sense if we don't understand how we got there. It becomes something that we implement and we do and we live and it loses purpose, but also it can turn us into People who, who hammer things religiously onto people in a way that cuts them off and damages what God is actually doing in their life and in the world. We run with what we get. And sometimes we establish ourselves in that with having no vision for the next phase. Because when you see something in, in the past and you see how he's, it gives you vision for some of what he's going to do in, this, in the next phase. We don't necessarily understand. He has an awesome plan. He really does. He has a complete, beautiful, wonderful plan. But we're so stuck with God did this. I know he did it and, and forget all the past. We get so stuck on it and we don't have any vision for the future. But when he, we see it being played out, when we see it being played out in history, that is the way God works. He moves things forward to it with this goal in mind. So back to the ancient wells. The ancient wells, each of these moves of God, they are sources to quench our thirst. We have a thirst, a longing, and it brings us life. It gives us life um, so that we're not empty and purposeless so that we can operate fully in our place so that we can know our place in that and God's purposes on the earth. Now we can live now instead of thinking of just the future after we die um, at some point. No, we can see that it is part of the process and we are in that place. We are part of it. The call and purpose to his people to operate, get lay our lives down like Jesus laid his life down. To have Emmanuel, this relationship, this closeness with God. You, everyone, every one of us, you have a place in God's kingdom. That's not heaven. That's not later. That's a glorious promise that we don't have to worry about dying. It's wonderful. I love that. We don't have to worry about dying. But the kingdom of God is at hand. It's right here. Because what God is doing now, <coughs> excuse me. What God is doing now is not less important. It's not less the kingdom of God than when it is fully here, right? In fact, it only arrives here because of these things. So you have a place. When, when God's plan is zoomed back, you know, like you pinch on a picture and you zoom it back, you want to be able to see it in context. It gives us a vision for how we fit into it. And so that's what, this is, that's what I'm talking about here, seeing it a little bit bigger. Seeing it more than forgiveness, because yes, that's forgiveness, that birth into his relationship with him, that kingdom place that you have in him and having my sins washed away. Love it. Hmm. I celebrate. I love it. I love being forgiven every single time that I've, I've ever failed and knowing the, 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 the depths of wickedness that, that would consume me and oppress me and control me, but seeing how the forgiveness washes me clean. And I walk into him knowing that he is lifting that I've been sprinkled by his blood. I know that I fit into it and I see purpose and have vision. So this is what God is having. He's showing us and he wants you to understand that. And, and knowing that there's more to it, 
than just repentance and having your sins forgiven. Because yes, that is a crucial step. And we must tell people and, and explain this, this, this beautiful way that God gives, shows us um, a way to be reconciled. But knowing it's more, it's bigger, it's complete. It's not just complicated. It's not even that complicated. Yes, it's hidden. And we must dig out, unstop those ancient places so that everyone can come and drink and receive. And so that's what we are called to do. Just like um, Isaac did with for his, the wells that his father dug, God wants us to dig those things out and let the water run again. Let the water flow to bring that life. Have a great day. I love God. I love you guys. He loves you so deeply. You need to love him with all your heart. Love him. Love him. Don't, don't just be pursuing it so that you can receive from him, but love him. Run this race, bros. Run it. I know that he, he's, he's in love with us. I love you guys. Until next time. See ya. Long ago in the garden it was to be Now a dream fulfilled in you and me 